Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. I see folks are trickling in. As you join us today, welcome for our conversation today, working through hard times, life and leadership lessons from 2020. My name is Emily Sandilands. I am Zinc Trains Community Builder, and I'm going to be your host today. I am thrilled to be here alongside our two presenters. We have Ari Weinzweig, who is Zingerman's founding partner and CEO. Hi, Ari. Hello, Emily. We also are joined by Timo Anderson, who is one of our fabulous trainers here at Zing Train. Hi, Timo. Hi, Emily. It's so nice to be here. <laughs> Welcome. We also have Mara Ferguson here with us. She is behind the scenes. Uh, she's going to be monitoring the chat and the Q&A with me. You can see both buttons there at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Speaking of chat, if you can locate the chat button there, we are going to do a roll call. Hear where you're tuning in from. We are all over Ann Arbor, Michigan right now, but we'd love to hear where you are. So feel free to send us your location there in the chat. Let's see where everyone's joining us from today. Oh, fabulous. Canada, folks in Michigan, Connecticut, wonderful. Yeah, keep those coming, that's great. Really fun to see where you're all coming from here. Maine. We are gonna Maine. leave some time at the end of today's conversation for question and answer, but we hope that you'll submit questions to us throughout the duration of today's conversation. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot them there by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We're gonna to try to get to as many as we can while we are here for the next hour or so. If we do not get to your question, not to worry, we will get back to you with an answer in the days to come. Last bit of housekeeping here before I turn it over to Timo. We um, are going to be recording the session today um, and we're gonna send that out to you in the days to come here. It's also going to live on our website, singtrain.com, in our library for all of time. So you can watch it anytime you want. All right, let's do this. I'm going to turn it over to you, Timo, to get us started. <clears throat> thanks, Emily. Um, thanks, Ari, for, for coming on and talking about this new pamphlet. It was, um, I'm thrilled that I got a preview copy and got to read it and think about it and, and read it again to think about it some more because it, it takes a couple readings. Um, for me, this latest pamphlet takes on a new format. The other ones have been really focused and on singular topics. And it reminds me a lot of the very first uh, Lapse Anarchist book, Building a Better Business, as a collection of learnings. What brought this collection together for you? Well, Timo, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm, I'm doing good. It's a beautiful day, which we don't get that many of in January. I, I'm relieved about any number of things that we can leave nameless. And uh, I'm happy that the pamphlet's out and I'm happy to be here with you. Uh, what brought it on? Uh, well, I just wrote a piece about it that came out yesterday. I, I was saying that the humility pamphlet, which came out in October, uh, thank you, Katie, uh, that came out in October, we'd been I've been working on in my head for like two years and in practice for a good year. Uh, and uh, this one was much more just sort of, I was journaling one morning, like in November maybe, and I thought, you know, this is a good time <laughs> to do this because I, like I said yesterday, I, I, I realized like I teach this stuff, I practice it, I am trying hard to do it. People call me when they're having a hard time and I'm like, I'm having a hard time getting through all this stuff given that we're not another two weeks, you know, spring is now two months away. So like, I can kind of see it coming. Uh, this was back in November. I'm like, okay, we made it through nine months. We got nine more months at least to go. This is a, you know, and I, I had said early on, it, it was like a marathon through a minefield. So I was sort of, and I'm clearly a long-term person by definition, you could tell from the fact that I'm still here 39 years later, but, uh, but even for me, it was getting emotionally challenging. And I just thought, you know, there's tools in here uh, that are good for the next nine months, but they're really good for the next nine years and 19 years and 29 years because they're the same things that I've been using for a long time and that they just work. And they're and and I'm also I'm biased because I'm a history major, but I, I think that it's helpful to have some historical context and construct for what was going on at the time. 
And so I, I, I don't know, the more I thought about it, the more I liked the idea of sort of bringing together this one piece that was like completely of the moment with this other piece that was completely, you know, like your kids could be using it long after I'm off the planet. So I, I, I thought that was cool. And the more I, I don't know, I just try to learn to t train myself to go not just to do any random intuitive thing that comes to my mind, but to bounce it off people like Jenny Tubbs or Maggie or whoever and sort of get their sense of it. And if, if the people whose intuitions I also trust tell me it's a good idea, then it just seemed good. And then Jenny was willing to do a ton of work to get it. I mean, it's a quick turnaround for a publication. But I, I realized in hindsight, like I said yesterday, other than the references to making phone calls from your car, uh, this really could have been written in 1919, halfway through the Spanish flu pandemic, because the tools are universally true. There you go, Timo. Thanks. Um, I, I have a number of questions written down, but one that keeps popping up in my head. I've traveled with you, um, ridden in cars with you for hours. I know your interest in music, but it was really interesting to read um, the the amount of music and the, the impact music had on you uh, that was shared through this. So could you talk about kind of uh, why that came out more in this and your thoughts and kind of including that yeah. level of person? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just tell the truth because that's a good way to do it. But uh, I, I mean, a lot of a lot of what I've trained myself to do by learning from other people like Brenda Ulan about writing is just to go with what comes into my head and not really worry about it. I used to worry about it a lot. Uh, but of course that doesn't help. And so I've trained myself to just keep typing and I have kind of come to look at it a little bit like, uh, riding a bike. If you stop pedaling out of fear, we know what happens. Either you stop or at worst you fall over. And the same, I've kind of come to approach writing the same way. Like, even if I think it's terrible, just keep typing. The faster I type, it's a little like hot pen with the visioning exercise that a lot of people on here will be familiar with. Uh, and, and then I also, uh, when I was like stuff just comes into my head and some of it's too weird and never sees the light of other people's day, but some of it is good. And so, uh, like in part four, I had the thought of the, uh, theory of relevantivity, which is that every, everything is relevant for everything. <laughs> and I, I believe that to be true. And the way the music entered into the draft of that preface was, uh, I was listening to a piece. I was listening to Adrian Lanker and Big Thief play. I like her music. And then I was reading an article, an interview. There was an interview with her in uh, New Yorker, I think, that came out. And so, I don't know, like there's good, interesting quotes and insights everywhere, right? And so I threw a couple in there. And then uh, in a good way, Jenny, in her editing said, there's way too much Adrian Lanker in here. It's like, it's all about Adrian Lanker. So I stood, but I really, it, it had helped me in the piece. I was reluctant and I took a little out and then I was like, well, sometimes when something's weak, we can, or when something's overdone, we can reduce it, but there's another option, which is to build up more around it, right? And so then I was like, well, it's not that she's too, there's too much Adrian Lanker, it's that there's not enough other music. <laughs> And then I do listen to a ton of music and it is an important piece of my life. And so then I went back through and started to look at other ways that music could be included in there because I'm always listening to music if I'm not on a Zing train talk or in one of the businesses talking to other people. So there you go. You, True, yeah, for those of you who previously read untold yet. story. I don't know if Jenny's on here or not. I, I will say that it, it, it's interesting because it includes a full she is. playlist Hi, Jenny. <laughs> of a number of different uh, uh, artists and, and albums and such in one of the chapter in the first chapter as well. So it's an interesting kind of addition for those of you who want to get another point of view on kind of the thoughts. Um, another thing. Yeah. In well, and now, it, of course, I, I have like 30 other musicians that I wish I had put in there, but yeah. Well, you, you have other books that theoretically are coming out. There's more space for more of those. Things. Yeah, I'm working on part two. Yeah. Um, in reading it, one of the things that struck me pretty quickly was the, the essay on the, the power of solitude section. Um, and then in that section, you talk about solitude uh, versus being alone. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak about the difference in the value you found in making that time for solitude? 
Yeah, and I like everything. I mean, we're all biased about everything. So I, I part of what's been in my mind, I mean, to state the obvious is like this, this pamphlet is merely my perspective of the last nine months. It's not meant to represent anybody else's. And, you know, if I were younger, it would be different. If I was one of your kids age, I would, it would be different. If I were black, it would be different. If I were, uh, you know, poorer or wealthy or whatever. I mean, so everything about us is, is tempering who, how we see things and what we perceive and the solitude piece for qualification comes through that because I am an introvert who prefers time alone. <laughs> so I, I tried to say it in the piece. I mean, I, I get it that it's easier for me at this stage of my life. Like time alone for me is a gift that I look forward to. Uh, and I, it doesn't mean I don't like seeing other people because it, I do, but I enjoy sitting home alone. Uh, I enjoy running alone. I enjoy your time alone. But I, I think I'm actually reading Vivek uh, Murthy, M-U-R-T-H-Y's book, Together. Uh, he's, once again, as of yesterday, the uh, Surgeon General. He was the Surgeon General under President Obama, and he actually, I met him because he came out here to interview me and Mara, who's on the call from Zinc Train, uh, in, in his, for his uh, book before it had come out. And uh, he talks a lot about loneliness and he talks in there about the difference. And I, I, I guess what I would say coming out of all that now is loneliness is a lot when we feel cut off, uh, not by choice. And when, and also where we feel like we're not able to be authentic and true to ourselves. So like for me, I feel loneliest. I mean, I know it sounds crazy, but I, one of the times I feel loneliest is at parties because I just feel so uncomfortable. Whereas if I'm at home writing or working or reading or whatever, or I feel calm. <laughs> so I, I think everybody's different. Um, and, and, but I, I think that the time alone, my experience of it and other people's experiences that seem similar is that mindfully chosen time alone allows us to access information that's inside ourselves that gets lost in the hubbub and the busyness of daily existence and if we don't make that time to be alone it's just, it's too easy for the stuff to get walked past and ignored and that's okay for a day maybe or two or three but in a situation like we're all dealing with right now i mean it's it's already hard enough for everybody to get through life anyway and then when you add all of the pressures of the last year on top of that, it, it's really hard. And so just carving out, even if it's, I, I mean, I get that I have a, a lot of advantages in many ways, but certainly in this context, I live with a woman who likes her own time alone. I, we don't have kids. Uh, you know, I've trained myself to create my own schedule so that I schedule time for myself to have time alone. But Nevertheless, it is, I think, a productive time for reflection. And even if it's 10 minutes or just walking outside, uh, whatever works. Journaling is obviously in here too. You're probably going to ask about that, but journaling is another way uh, of doing that for me. And then other people have their own ways of doing it. If the, you know, whether it's rowing or climbing, or I don't know, everybody get their own thing. You sit in your sauna. I do. I, I sit in my sauna two to three times a week, and it's it's a space that I have. It's fulfilled for me that you know you're kind of running, and I know you run you know every day, give or take, and it's about yeah. putting that one foot forward. To me, it, the sauna has helped uh, minimize the loss of playing basketball that I would do every week. Mm -hmm. um, not being great, but it not mattering because being with a group of people, being able to do that engagement, mm -hmm. that connection, was a tool for me to help get through. And so losing that because it's a together obviously a together inside thing yeah. um, has been a big loss. Um, yeah, so I would imagine. That makes sense. Yeah. So cool. My sauna has been a space for that. Um, so you mentioned journaling and you've talked about journaling. You've written about journaling a lot. I know any workshop I do with you, journaling comes up. Can you kind of explain for some people who might not have heard yeah. about it, kind of the role of journaling um, and then how it might have changed even during these times where it's a little more, there's more on the plate and there's more kind of hanging around. Yeah, the piece uh, that's in here, I wrote in the spring and it came, I mean, I've been journaling for 30 years, more. Uh, and I, 
I learned, uh, I mean, it's, it's not like I had never heard the word, but what triggered me to actually start doing it was uh, being in, going to therapy and uh, my therapist suggesting one day that I was really good at ruminating and that was problematic. And I, to be honest, didn't know what ruminating meant. And so uh, it's, that's embarrassing in itself because cows chew their cud and all the cheese that we work with, I ought well to have known. But I didn't. But anyway, ruminating, if you, like me, don't know what it means, it means that you go around and around in your head. And so I was exceedingly good at making myself crazy uh, by worrying, rehashing, sort of like being your own ESPN analyst after a bad game. Uh, it's easy to pick apart what went wrong and then do a million what ifs. And Anyway, it's not very productive. If you do it, you probably know. If you don't do it, I wouldn't suggest trying to do it. Uh, and he suggested journaling would be a good way to help. And I wrote about this actually in, in Power Beliefs in Business because it was a great example for me of one place that my beliefs had changed. I mean, on a kind of low grade level, but uh, at the time that he said it, I mean, my I don't think I said it out loud, but my instinctive reaction, or it's not even instinctive, my learned reaction from childhood of growing up a boy and not even that typical a boy, but a boy in, in the US was like journaling is like for high school girls to keep a diary, like I'm not gonna do that. And I, I'm saying that just cause that, that was sort of the social norm that or belief that had I had taken in in my childhood. And of course it was totally wrong uh, and shows you how much beliefs can get in the way of doing things or learning things or connecting with people or things that we are, a, afraid of or don't fit the beliefs that we've been given. So anyway, eventually I started. And at that point, having 30 years of stuff stored up, there was a lot to say. And so I, and, and a lot of it was pretty intense and, but it was way better to get it out because in my head, it just goes around and around and around. And it's a little like driving a traffic circle for an hour and then being pissed off that you didn't get anywhere. This, this allowed me to move forward and it wasn't always smooth and it wasn't always clear where I was going, but at least it allowed me to move forward and to start unpiling sort of this giant pile of rocks that was in my head that if every day more stuff's going in there, it's like your computer, I guess it backs up the hard drive, can't function. And so then I just, once I got going, I mean, it just made such a big difference that I just kept going. and like with running, I, I, I do better when I just decide that's what I'm going to do every day. There's no exceptions, then I just do it. So uh, now, 30 years later, and for a long time now, I mean, it's far less intense. And because if you empty your brain daily, there's just not that much in there that's forcefully needs to be emptied, but it's still very grounding. And again, everybody in the world can have their own techniques. I'm not saying that they're guaranteed to work for everybody. But I have found with so many people that it makes an enormous difference because they too are going around and around in their head and they get lost. And I was lost too. And uh, I, I'm reminded of it. I mean, you and I have taught it in the Managing Ourselves seminar. And like, I, I mean, I've, I remember teaching it in San Francisco one time and a sous chef was in the training class. And I, we, I did that exercise where people for basically free write journal for, I mean, under 10 minutes, like six minutes or so. So I would ask people how it went. And he's like, I feel like 10 years has been lifted off my shoulders in six minutes. And then I literally just got an email from a, a guy I've been trying to be supportive of who's struggling with a number of things. And I mentioned to him that this had helped me a lot. And I was like, it's just huge. And he just emailed me today to say like how much in two days, how much difference it's making. So there you go. Have, have you noticed and, and in fact, the, the idea for the pamphlet came while I was journaling. Okay. Have you noticed any difference in your journaling or kind of the, the response from people and accepting journaling as a possible tool over the past nine, 10, 11 months as you've shared it? Because you've shared it for uh, decades. I don't know if I've seen a difference in the last nine months. I, I've seen a difference over the 20 years or 15 years. Um, I think people are more open to it, but it's still, I, I mean, I have this kind of, I'll share it with the group that's here. I mean, I, I have this, it's not really a secret, but I have this fantasy of like having pe paying people for 10 minutes on the clock before they actually go onto the floor in, in quotes for their shift to journal. Cause my experience of it is they would be so much more grounded that it would reduce mistakes, reduce tensions, reduce drama on the shift. And I, I, 
one day I'm going to have the guts to try suggesting that and see if anybody will go for it. But I, I mean, it really, it, it's, it's no different than understanding that our, like improving our immune systems through better eating and exercise and psychological well-being and in Dr. Murthy's case, uh, not being lonely. Uh, it, it can only help to enhance our immune systems. It doesn't guarantee that we're not going to get sick or get COVID or whatever, but uh, it, it still helps us. And this is the same thing. It doesn't guarantee no mistakes would happen. But if you look at what the cost of one uh, mistake at the deli or one mistake at the roadhouse, or, you know, it, it can be hundreds of dollars. So the, the cost of five, 10 minutes of journaling is pretty low. And as you say in the pamphlet, the cost of the materials to do it are pretty cheap. I think you exceedingly cheap. I don't, I don't remember what a phone costs now, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's pretty cheap. Uh, so yeah, and the in my own journaling, I I haven't really noticed, and that's kind of what made me write about it. Was like people were asking me like, well, what are you doing to take care of yourself? Like as if this was this. I mean, in a way, it's clearly new, but then at the same time, I I just was like, I'm not really doing anything any different. I just have had this regimen and I just have stuck to the regimen and it works. I mean, so uh, there's a, a lot of what's in the pamphlet are the other piece are other pieces, not all of them, but other pieces. I was just going to insert Doug's question here. Do you share your journaling or is it usually private? What do you do with your journaling? No, I just keep it. I'm a history major. I don't even, I mean, I, there's times in my life where I've gone back to look at stuff. Uh, but in general, it's really just to clear my head. Um, it's not like people understandably confused when I say I'm journaling, they think I'm like writing a book that way, but I don't. I mean, it doesn't mean I don't have an idea while I'm journaling, but it's a million times easier to write on the computer because I can type way faster than I can write by hand. It's easier to read it uh, because even I can't read my own writing sometimes. And, and I can cut and paste and all that, but it's really just, to get it out of, of, of my head. Uh, Jewel, I do it in the morning. Um, how are you, Jewel? I do it in the morning. Uh, I like to clear my mind. I know some people who do it at the end of the day before they go to bed, but everybody's got their own thing. But for me, as I, Timo's heard me say a million times when we teach, I mean, I kind of have come to look at it like stretching uh, before I run. And I know stretching, actually, I do stretch after I run, which, which is even more important, but just to like loosen up for the day. And as I try to, uh, I was talking to my friend Molly Stevens on the way here to the, do the session, and she was, she's a Buffalo, grew up in Buffalo, so she's very excited about the Buffalo Bills winning football games right now in the playoffs. And she was, I, I haven't paid a ton of attention because the my team's long gone. But uh, anyway, she was commenting about Tom Brady, and he went to Michigan. I'm not a huge Tom Brady fan per se, but you know, she was saying it's just such a miracle that he can keep this going at 43. And it's like, well, he has these regimens that he's been doing. It's not the only reason, but he's, I think, vegan, certainly vegetarian. Uh, he, you know, yoga, I mean, all these things that have helped him to be in shape. So I think this fits with that. Thanks. You obviously hit a vein with the questions that came in on journaling. Another thing that I think about in kind of the, the mental health or kind of the, the space of keeping oneself, your full self healthy, Mm -hmm. um, I read, I was reading the Hope um, Six Pointed Star section. Um, and as you were talking about it in the section, you know, you, you talked some about the, the emails that you started to do. And as I was reading that, I was remembering seeing those first few emails when they came out on a daily and kind of seeing them at night and sitting and reading them and them being kind of a, a, a positive kind of a thing of, okay, what's happening to get clear? So I wasn't making my own guesses. Yeah. Um, so, I, it was interesting to hear you kind of connect that to that because I'd share it. We talk about it with Zing Train as a team. I talk about it with my wife and my family to kind of have this space that I knew I could get this thing. Um, you talked about that transition to realizing hope. Can you talk, think about, or share some of the thoughts on kind of how that came about? Do you think how hope became inculcated into that, but also kind of the naturalness that it started and where those all came from? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, the humility pamphlet just came out in whatever, October, September, and it's a subject that, as I tell in the pamphlet, I really had given uh, probably almost no conscious thought to in my entire adult life up until a couple of years ago when I got asked to speak uh, 
at a symposium by Jamie Vanderbrook, who's a wonderful human being who used to work for us. And so I didn't have the guts to say no. So I said yes. And, uh, and then I started to learn about it. And I, my experience is like almost anything, at least for me, and I, I think a lot of people have the same, is that they start to study. It's actually really interesting. Like there's not that much you can study with some intent and not start to learn. And so that learning process triggers in my experience, the desire to learn more. So whether that's about plants or tr like things I would think I have zero interest in, like the history of trains, <laughs> turns out to be really interesting. Like I didn't know so many of the European bookstore, big bookstore chains started because they opened up when they had train stations and people needed to buy something to read on the train, right? So who would, who would know? But anyway, um, so humility really came out like that and hope started much the same way. I had never thought about it at all, except when I was working on part four uh, of the book, I, I, don't, I, I started to read something about hope in the workplace and, or it wasn't even about hope in the workplace, it was just about hope and humanity and like what happens when you don't have hope. And uh, I started to read more and I started to read more. And then I, the more I studied it, the more I realized like it has this enormous impact when you have hope you do better <laughs> when you have no hope or low hope you don't do well and clearly uh, you and i i would suggest live in a high hope ecosystem so we are surrounded by hope those notes are just one small piece of it and it's much easier to have hope when you when you're in our situation clearly that said uh, even people in more disadvantaged settings still show the same positive benefit from grounded hope or the same negative implications from lack of hope right so the more i studied it and the more i realized like this it costs nothing and and then what really triggered me was to, to study it and, and try to apply it was realizing that i happened to watch two uh situations which i wrote about in part four but i happened to watch two different unrelated situations where you know well-meaning manager basically crushed the hope of an, of an hourly employee who had an idea and it wasn't intended to do anything wrong and the manager was probably correct about the content but i i was like whoa but then i in in the spirit of paul's little saying when furious get cur when furious get curious i reflected because it wasn't i realized it wasn't the manager's fault i mean we'd never talked about hope we didn't have any training about hope it wasn't an expectation that you build hope wasn't even anything that had ever come up, right? So it wasn't appropriate or equitable for me to blame the manager. It was on me and on us as organizations. So that's really where the studying came from. And then like the humility, I started to realize that we had actually done a lot of things here that had embedded hope. We just hadn't realized it and we hadn't called it out, right? So I don't know if that helps, but that that's what I think happened in the notes. So the story of the notes is that when the pandemic hit, as I'm sure for most people in the world, it was uh, pretty shocking. As I uh, wrote in the pamphlet, I kind of came to equate it as a, to the impact of an earthquake. One day things seemed fine. And then a day later, like some buildings were totally as they were and some had completely collapsed and holes open in the ground. And, and uh, I think effective connection, uh, our version of your basketball team at work create hope. It creates positive feeling. It helps people feel, I don't know, grounded like they belong, right? And and we're very big on sharing information. And then all of a sudden, like people couldn't go to the other businesses, and they, a lot of them were staying home. And we had furloughed 280 people, or I don't know what the number was, a lot. And and people who were used to having high levels of organizational communication were left in literally and emotionally in the dark. And so I didn't know what to do either, but I just thought, okay, here's one thing I can do is start sending a note. And I didn't intend to do it every night, really. It's just, I mean, at the beginning, we had no idea what we were dealing with, right? I didn't know if this is, and so I just kept it going. And in hindsight, I don't really know how I did it, but I did it every night for a hundred nights. Uh, and I know because when I was thinking of stopping, I counted and it was like 92 or something. And so I was like, well, I like it's good if I can get to 100. And what I had set for myself was I would keep going until uh, we started the ZCOB huddle again uh, because we hadn't been huddling. And that was one of the best ways to share information. And then also until we could reopen uh, 
like the dining areas at the coffee house and the roadhouse and the deli because then people could actually go see each other again. So those two things happened. And then like four or five days later, I shift a weekly and I'm still going. And after we're done here, I'm going to go work on tonight's note. But anyway, how did, how did hope you, you, what you asked me is how did hope get in there? Hope got in there because we've internalized it. So in, in Zing train language, we're on many of us have become, I'm not saying we're so smart. It's just, we become unconsciously competent in, building hope. And then when I got all these comments from people, like how hopeful the notes were, which was not my intent, I went back and reread them. I'm like, oh yeah, I uh, guess I did all six of those things multiple times. So of course it's building hope. So there you go. Yeah. They were very hopeful. Um, I was one of those furloughed people. And so getting that information and again, I, I absolutely agree that, you know, the constant flow of information, whether it's stopping into coffee or running to you or anyone else at the bakehouse, you know, was missed, you know, cause it wasn't going to happen and I didn't know where I was going to be. And so getting that was kind of the, oh, here's what's going on. Just so everybody knows, here's what's going on. Instead of being on an island and wondering, um, cause when we wonder, we all kind of go that other direction. Oftentimes we go that yeah. other direction. We think of the worst. Um, and so having that became a beacon of there's some real, um, continuity and there's an opportunity and things are things are still moving it hasn't fallen apart because we didn't know because we hadn't seen yeah well in hindsight now that you say that i'm also reminded although i didn't write it in the essay that it actually it builds on humility too because a lot of what was in the notes was i, I don't know what's going to happen yeah you know but then stating a positive belief which i had which is we were going to figure it out together because when i look back on our history, I could see a lot of times where we had been in similarly, seemingly similar situations of darkness and uncertainty and craziness in the world, and we had made it through. So it was, me I meant it, but at the same time, uh, I think having the humility in hindsight to just say, like, I don't know the answer, but together we're going to figure this out probably helped. All right. We'll jump to another one of the essays. This one kind of caught me off guard. It, it makes sense knowing you're, you're, you do like to play with words and make them have, um, make them bend to your outcomes or your wants and kind of blend them in oh, unique I'm like trying ways. to figure out which essay it is. Okay, I got it. <laughs> and so I would love to just have you quickly describe Kind Zen um, mm -hmm. a little bit and then just, you know, share some of the impacts had on you and others around you as you've kind of thought about it and, and put it out into the world by sharing it in this essay, but had it in your own self. Yeah, well, once again, I mean, this is, I guess, part of the beauty of teaching myself and with a lot of help from others, but of learning to write because like weird shit just comes in my head and I tried to teach myself to let it come out because it may not get published, but at least there's often beauty and insight in these seemingly random thoughts that are easy to brush off. And I think that's metaphorically what happens in society at large. We've, I've certainly done it to other people, which I don't feel good about, but it's inevitable. I've done it many times. And so, uh, I mean, the story's kind of just in, in, the, in, the, in the essay in the pamphlet. I mean, uh, Doc Glatz, Peter Glatz, people could look up G-L-A-T-Z or Mara or Emily will throw the link to his W-E-M-U interview in the chat before I can even finish the sentence probably. But uh, he and his wife, Anne, and their cute little dog, Toulouse, uh, had come. Uh, they, so Doc uh, was a dentist for many years. And uh, I had met him through, and his wife, Julianne, uh, through Southern Foodways Alliance at the symposium every year. And Julianne was disabled. And so uh, they bought a bus that they could drive, like an old school bus that they could drive. And they would drive from Chicago, my hometown and his hometown. He has a wonderful Chicago accent, much more than mine. Um, and uh, Anyway, he had uh, gone down there and that's where I met him. And then they started coming to Camp Bacon every year because it was a fundraiser for SFA, for Southern Foodways. And it's only a four hour drive from Chicago. And then they were supposed to come, I don't know what it was, six, seven, you might remember, or Myra might remember, but they were supposed to come one year, five, six years ago. And uh, his wife died suddenly. And uh, Zing Train 
not me, but the crew at Zing Train had the great thought to gift him a visioning seminar because clearly he was going to need to remake his life. And so he came a year later, I think, roughly, and he wrote a vision. And the vision said he was going to sell his practice and go become a cook, which is what he had always wanted to do, but he had had this practice. So he did that. And they basically started living on the road. And he's gone around and done uh, stages, you know, cooking in different restaurants. And uh, they were supposed to go up north uh, to work. And then the pandemic happened. So they couldn't because the place didn't open. Um, and uh, he didn't know what to do. So I was like, well, if you come, he had parked in the roadhouse parking lot with the bus when they were here for two days or three days for Camp Aiken. I'm like, just come on. So he ended up parking there and working on Tammy's farm, helping her and hanging out. But anyway, their bus on the side says, make America kind again. I thought that was a nice thing and I was just thinking about it and then one day oh hi doc and then one day I said uh to myself like you know kaizen kaizen hard not to put together and then the beauty of kaizen one of the beauties is it gives a discipline doc you could come on and spill me in on what I said wrong about your story but anyway uh he, the idea that that Doc and Ann have on the bus about make everything kind. I was like, yeah, why not? I mean, there's nothing to lose. And without getting into policy arguments at a national level, like I don't really understand why people can't be kind. And as I wrote in the pamphlet essay, at the time when the tensions in the country were so high this summer, and there was a lot of articles appearing about uh, you know, we need to return to civility. And I kept thinking like, you know, civility is better than like bashing each other, but it's so neutral. <laughs> like, and I was like, it's like we arrive, we hate each other, but we're going to have a ceasefire and I'm going to be polite, even though I can't stand seeing you. And I'm like, that's really not the point. And kindness seemed much more intentional and it seemed like it was freely chosen and it was brought with love and care. And that when that was happening, I just seemed like only good things could come from it. So that's where that came from. And then like all this stuff, like journaling or running or whatever, if, if we create a rigor for ourselves, it works better, right? And I think that's a lot of the beauty of what Zinc Train, Maggie, the books, everything has contributed to people over the years is like, it's not just get the idea of giving a good service. It's here's three steps to great service. It's not just have a vision. It's here's how you write one. And so... I just kind of made up a construct for kind Zen. Thank you. Ironically, today I was reading on page 90 something in Dr. Murti's book, and he has the story, it's not, he didn't make it up, but of uh, the mayor of Anaheim, who apparently has made his big campaign for like the last five or seven years or something to make Anaheim one of the kindest cities anywhere, and they've made seemingly great progress. Cool. There you go. Something for all of us to look into more. Who thought Anaheim? Yeah. Um, I'd love to, we are on a Zoom call. I know, I don't, I don't know about you, but I spend a lot of time. Your on reality that. checks are working. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm in, it's, it's whether me meetings or trainings or pieces or other things happening. Um, it feels like I'm, you know, constantly in, in connection, um, whatever you'd like to call this type of connection with other people. Mm -hmm. um, but could you describe your suggestion or your thoughts on picking up the phone and the impact it has versus kind of these connections that we're doing um, and how it's kind of worked for you over the mm -hmm. throughout the pandemic in, in general? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess the, I don't know. Maybe it's old school. I just I've never had a high affinity for scheduling phone calls doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It's just not my thing. But uh, I guess I've, you know, going back to your question about solitude. So back in the old days, before I went to therapy, before I was journaling, before I was running, when I was making myself completely crazy, not just slightly crazy, uh, part of my belief, not uncommon, if we're stereotyping, which I don't like to do, but American male thing like I'm supposed to be able to figure out my own problems and I learned that in my family I'm sure growing up too and so 
when under pressure, retreat, talk to no one while you try to figure it out. Like was the message that I had grown up with without blaming, just that's what I had. So that's what I would do. And it didn't work really very well. Uh, and then trying to learn to do it differently is when in doubt and when under pressure and when stressed is reach out to people, not necessarily randomly, but people that I feel safe with, that I feel like I can learn from, that I feel will have some perspective that could be valuable and that I care about, right? So uh, I've been, I mean, for years I've been calling people not, this is one that has, the journaling hasn't really changed. This one I've amped up uh, over the last 10 months, uh, but partly because I'm not traveling and so I don't see anybody. But uh, so I just, for years, I just, I wrote about it in the time management essay too. It's like, you're sitting in the car, like, and I don't, you and I live here, so we don't have long commutes, but I mean, I have friends in LA, they're like in the car for an hour each way to work. I'm like, I don't know, you could like call every friend you got in a week. <laughs> uh, so I've long been doing that and I like it. And then when I started to get super stressed, like everybody, when all this was going down and I didn't know what was going to happen either. And it was scary. And I had all the same kind of fears, like, you know, we could, we owe money, we could go bankrupt. I could lose my house. I mean, all the crazy stuff that isn't that all of a sudden isn't that crazy. And so just starting to call people with greater regularity, even than I had already. And uh, same kind of thing happened with the, as I described with the hope essays, like I, I mean, I told the story in the essay, but I was just talking to uh, my friend and I didn't say her name in there, but it was Mary Sue Milliken was that particular call from border grill in LA. And we talk fairly regularly, but anyway, at the end of the call, you know, she goes, thanks for calling. It's so great. And I'm like, no, thank you. It's, it's really great talking. And she had like shared a bunch of challenges they had, which were not hugely different from ours. And I said, I don't think I really helped you with anything that you're struggling with. She goes, no, I feel whatever, 10 times better. And I'm like, well, I feel better too. <laughs> and then I kind of realized like it, it wasn't really about solving any problems. Although once in a while ideas come up, but there was just something to be gleaned and gained from the connection. And so it works. And I've told it to other people who have started doing it. And it's, I, I don't know if it used to be the norm, but it's certainly not the norm these days. Everybody texts and I don't think it's bad to text, but it takes a really long time to just say what I just said on a text. So, and it only took like two minutes. So it, it's just, there's something for me, everybody's different. Like some people want to see people in person that I'm as an introvert, less needy in that way, but I do like to hear voices and bounce stuff off people and, and hear what they're thinking about and it's helped and right. it's easy and everybody's got a phone. Yeah. I mean, and they're, and the best part is it's not just at home. So you don't have to catch them in the evening or like interrupt their work. Now everybody has it on their body yes. all the time. Yes. And one of the reactions is people are like, well, I don't want to bother people. I'm like, okay, I went to therapy where one of the many good things I learned was you don't have to answer your phone. It's totally fine. If you don't feel like answering, don't answer. And so then I was like, I, they don't have to answer, like whatever. And the other thing that, I mean, that's changed in the pandemic that I will say is way more people answer. Yeah. So I've actually like people who typically I might call no joke 15 times before I got them on the phone. Like now I answer almost every other time. Keeping that Increasing. There's not a lot of upsides to the pandemic, but that's one of them. Increasing connection in its own way. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to check in with Emily because I, I wanted to keep us on a timely path and just check to see if there's questions that are that have popped up that you'd like to ask or kind of answer. I have a couple more that I, I or at least one more I'd love to ask, but I wanted to see what had come in if we had missed anything to make sure we didn't miss stuff from, from this really good uh, group. Yeah, we do have a couple of questions um, that I would love to pose to Ari. Uh, we had a question about working with people who have different beliefs around masks. Um, so around just, masks? Yeah, so despite different views, um, this person was talking about enjoying working. You know, everybody enjoys working together despite those different beliefs. Uh, do you have any advice to share with people for how to work uh, harmoniously together with people who have different beliefs? on that stuff? It's hard, I would imagine. Uh, we, we are fortunate because I would say we're in a bubble 
in a bigger bubble <laughs> that uh so i i i have not been in a situation where we've had colleagues not wanting well they might have not wanted to wear them just like sometimes i don't want to be nice to people but it's part of the job expectation and it was quickly made part of the job expectation here so it, we didn't have a lot of staff resistance we did have some uh, customer resistance I actually some, i don't know why but i saw some clip of a manager at trader joe's it's probably like all, i don't look at social media but it's probably like all over social media and he was insistently politely not letting these people in the store because they didn't want to wear masks i mean I don't know, it's it's no different than, you know, like wearing a shirt in a restaurant is not more sanitary. Like, I mean, there's nothing on, on, on this part of my arm that's not on my chest, right? So it's just, but that's the norm. And so I think there's not a restaurant in the country that's gonna, other than on a beach, that's gonna let you come in without a shirt on, right? And people aren't arguing about freedom over their shirt. It's just, this is the norm. So. I guess from my end, I can respect that people don't want to. I don't need to judge them. Uh, so I'm fortunate, I guess, I'm not really in that situation. I guess here we made quick decisions and then repeated to continually made those decisions throughout to go with what we were learning from people who know way more than I do about health. Uh, because in the same way, like I have opinions about buildings, but I wouldn't be the one who designs the infrastructure of a building we were building because I don't understand engineering. Like I could tell them that I think that it's going to stand up, but if they tell me it's not, I'm going to redesign the building, right? And so when, for me, when people who are, have studied epidemiology and who know a million times more than I do, when the health department who does this for a living is telling us this is what we should do, then we, we opted here to do that. Um, but I, I do understand that we're in a setting that generally people have bought into that much more quickly than in many places. So it's hard. I don't have a great answer. Well, that is that is the hard one. Um, Kimberly had a question for you, Ari. Okay, what uh, is it? Thanks for sharing your experience. As always, very helpful. Her question today is about your black T-shirt. Mm. Uh, this one. Yeah, so she's oh, just in general or the one I'm wearing now? Which one you're wearing today. And oh. where the t-shirt is. Can you see that? With each other. I like it. It's from, uh, it's from uh, AK Press. Okay. You could look them up online. AK, AK Press, did you say? I did. Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you. Hopefully, I have a lot of black t-shirts. Yes. Known I, can't, I can't say that I particularly chose it for today. There's <laughs> actually uh, one that we did for the Roadhouse that has the cover of the pamphlet. Well, it doesn't have the cover. It has the drawing that's on the cover of the pamphlet. That's really cool. Different application. So I thought about wearing that, but then I thought, who's going to see my t-shirt on a Zoom call? It doesn't even matter. But Unless somebody has questions. shows you what I know. That was wrong. Um, I've got a couple more here, Timo. How does that work with your... That sounds great. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, my Wu says, hello, Ari, true privilege to hear you speak today. Um, what advice would you give to a small business working remotely these days about ways to check in with everyone to make sure they are okay? And we Zing Train are a fully remote team at the moment. Yeah, I was going to say, Emily, you and Timo could probably share as much as I can. Uh, I, I mean, I think the notes were a way that I figured to do that. Uh, the phone calls are another way. I, I think, I don't know how many people are on your team, but if there's 10, uh, you call one of them or two of them a day. You have talked to everybody just one-on-one -on -one in a casual way, uh, you know, each week. So I think that helps. I think asking people helps. Uh, as you know, Emily and Timo and anybody, Jenny from Zinc Train, who facilitated the ZCAB huddle beautifully this morning, uh, we've started huddling again that was one of the things that we lost in the earthquake of the pandemic was we stopped huddling which i you know in hindsight i would say why did we do that but of course it was a little chaotic and no one knew what to do and i never even heard of zoom let alone would know how to talk on it so we've had to figure that out i do i like zoom huddles as much as the others no but they do have some advantages like people can log on from home without having to drive 40 minutes to get here etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh so I think that helps too. Uh, so huddling is our 
weekly or monthly uh, open book gathering where we basically run the business and we have somebody like Jenny this morning or each business I don't know, who facilitates at Zinc Train. Uh, that's Elian. Okay, so huddle. Each, each huddle has somebody who facilitates so that it stays on track uh, and guides the conversation. But it's, it's again, it's a regimen team and Emily, right? Like journaling, I mean, the rigor of doing it regularly really helps. So all of those things. And I, I mean, I guess I would say too, is that the point of the pamphlet is like, I believe all of the things that are in there help. So writing a vision helps. Uh, picking up the phone helps. Journaling helps. Embracing solitude helps. Um, looking back on your business's history is one of the pieces in there to understand where you've, or your personal life history, where you've been through hard times, because you can draw on those lessons and, and build uh, going forward from those. So I don't know if any of that helps, but. Yeah. I would I would also want to add, and it's a, a another link to one of your pamphlets, but the energy, I mean, the energy crisis mm -hmm. and the energy management, you know, at the beginning of each of our huddles at Zing Train, we talk about, you know, what is your energy? What are you bringing to the space? And it's a way yeah. to check in and touch base with each other in a really soft, non kind of confrontational way of saying, hey, how are things going? Um, and it's not getting psychological or whatever, just a here's a number and that number yeah. can change. And, and that's a, another great way for, you know, trying to, how do you keep aware of other people? That one I think has really helped us at Zing Train stay practiced at that skill. Yeah, and I, Timo, you're reminding me too, in that context, uh, in the art of business uh, pamphlet, it was really me starting to say like for myself and then for others, like if that looking at life, like, we were making art or painting or music or poetry or whatever, uh, we would put a whole lot more thought into it in the same way that kind Zen pushes us to like consider every tiny interaction we have and bring kindness to it, uh, that, that treating everything like art. And then part of that is also seeing the beauty in everything. And uh, John O'Donohue, who, uh, whose work I really like, and he said, he talked about uh, the statement beauty is in the eye of the beholder is generally used, interpreted or applied to mean that we each get to decide what we think is beautiful, which might be true, but he said it's there's another way you could read it. And that's uh, that we need to train our eye to see the beauty. And and so out of that, I created, I don't know what's on the list, Jenny, you'll know 15 or 20 uh, exercises around how to bring more art practice into our existence and i'm happy to email if anybody wants to email me it's ari at zingermans.com i'll send you back the draft list because i learned from what you all are doing but but so timo i think that's another way would be to uh help people learn these this this thinking about art and find the beauty in each other's work and in in even in the pandemic there is still beauty and that's kind of what part of what drove me on the pamphlet was to bring that out even in the pain Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions here. I wanna be mindful of time. We've got about five more minutes. I see we have several questions here. So again, if we do not get to your question today, okay. I will field those over to Ari. Um, and I see, I see Jenny put another good addition a note on the huddle too, which I agree with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so follow up question about people with different beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, wants to know at what point are other people's beliefs so offensive that you should sever ties with them well i guess i i don't know the answer i mean i think we all struggle i guess i i guess the severing ties implies that not just that they have the belief but that they're imposing the belief on you or your space or your energy Cause like you might, you know, just being completely innocuous and we get along pretty well, I think, but you know, like Emily, I don't really know what you think in the darkness of your brain. So you might have a belief that I'm an idiot and you hate me, but you've never said that. Well, you, you don't say that. I'm just saying like, it doesn't really matter to me that much what's in your head that much because the way you behave is with integrity and kindness and we get along well. So I don't know, you know, so it's, it's less what you actually believe and more if you're forcing that belief into my face or my space, then it's, uh, then it becomes a bigger problem. And so 
I, I guess I would say I have a fair few friends who have pretty different beliefs than mine, but because they're they're not dogmatic about it and I'm not dogmatic about mine. So I'm not asking them to change their belief. I just, we can connect over the things that we, sh we have uh, that work and we can leave the pieces that might not connect on the side. So it's, but I, but I think, you know, Timo brought up the energy and I, I learned from Anish Cavanaugh, my friend and who teaches it. Uh, Mara could put the links in and I wrote about her work in part two and how it's helped us as Timo referenced. But, learning to manage my own energy. So if somebody's in trying to push beliefs onto me, that is learning to disengage, which is not how I grew up because I grew up learning to argue. But if I can disengage and just like, okay, you know what, I'm done. So I, I don't need to be mean about it. I can just say, you know what, I got to run. Finished. Yeah. It's harder. I have friends. I, I don't have a lot of friends who have like drastically different whatever political beliefs, which is, you know, or mask beliefs. So it's easier for me. I have some friends who have close relatives. Uh, it's not uncommon right now that have pretty different beliefs. And it's hard because they're stuck in a situation where they want to, as Timo talked about, connect with these people who've been close in their life for a long time, but it's become painful. So it's, it's hard. I think this is, to be honest, where the journaling can help because it allows you to get it out in, on paper in a way that's not getting in an argument. Yeah. I don't know if that's helpful at all. Yeah, you can let us know, Mary. Um, thank you for your question. I think we have time maybe for one more question. So I okay, can I'll try to talk fast. Ask one here, or if that's okay, Timo, if we if we do one more. Audience. Absolutely, I, I can ask questions of Ari all the time. So getting people <laughs> who are on this panel doing that is, is a lot more effective. Absolutely. Okay. And again, if your question didn't get asked today, um, we will get those over to Ari and get uh, back to you with some answers here soon. Uh, Matt want, had a great question. He wanted to know if you had been told uh, Zingerman's had to cease operations this Sunday, what would you do on Monday, mm -hmm. the following day? Well, I don't want to be flip, but I would probably not do that much different than what I did every other day. Uh, because I would still get up and journal and I got more books to read than I, even if I didn't order any more, which I have five more on order, I could probably go for three years without catching up. And I have so much writing, like I've already outlined in my head, uh, the part two of this pamphlet and part two of the art pamphlet and a book on the ecosystem. And then I'd go run and then Tammy and I would cook dinner. So, I mean, I'd probably have a lot of freak outs, but journaling and phone calls and all that stuff that we just talked about would probably help me. I think they were a team. Sounds but like. Matt, we're going to hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> Good question, but yes, we will keep our fingers crossed here. Um, all right, let's see. Yeah, Quiet by Susan Cain is very good. And I liked better even if you Google Introverts Atlantic Monthly from like 10 years ago or more. There's a, I don't even know the guy's name, but it's an awesome, I thought awesome essay. I liked, I liked quiet, but that essay helped me even more. Wonderful. Well, thank you everyone. Hi, Marie. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I just said hi, Marie. Oh. <laughs> hi, Marie. Um, well, we have a couple more. Again, uh, to be mindful of folks' this time here today, I, I'm going to just kind of wrap things up, uh, but we will get your questions over to Marie. Um, okay. Thank you, everyone, for the wonderful questions. Um, and thank you for joining us today and for being part of the conversation here in the chat and in the Q&A. It was a very lively, lively session, which is always appreciated. A huge thank you to you, Ari and Timo. Yeah, well, I want to thank you guys. I really, really want to thank Jenny Tubbs because she does amazing work. And I, I can have all the ideas in the universe and I can type all day, but somebody has to turn that into something that looks like this without the pen mark that I got on it. Uh, <laughs> And uh, it's, it's really uh, inspiring to work with her. And then also Ian Nagy, who's drawing, scratchboard drawing is on the cover. Uh, and then Sammy Melton from the Roadhouse, who said it was okay to use her drawing on the cover. Uh, but really just to the whole ZCOB and then really to our greater ecosystem, because part of why I'm able to do this is because of you all and 
I feel incredibly fortunate to be in such a positive ecosystem. It's much easier to have hope when you're surrounded by people who have hope. It's much easier to wear the mask when everybody around you is listening to the same epidemiologist. It's much easier uh, to go to work where we have diversity of opinion and diversity in many angles, but where we're still going to the same place and the same values and the same vision. So thank you all. Uh, I, I truly feel honored to be a small piece of this. Absolutely. I'm going to do a couple of housekeeping things. Thanks, Ari. Um, Timo, unless you had anything you wanted to say. No, I just wanted to say thank you for the for answering the questions and turn it to you, Emily, because I know there's a couple of pieces you want to make sure we get in. I see them being dropped by Mara. So. Yes. So Mara, uh, my partner in crime here, is going to drop a couple of links here. Um, we are going to be announcing on Monday our newest masterclass led by Mr. Ari. Hey, I, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> you're doing that. And, uh, <laughs> Ari um, is going to be running our next master class all about managing ourselves with uh, Zinc Train's founder, Maggie Bayless. Um, we're going to be sending out the announcement on Monday as well as a call to get on the VIP list. And VIPs are going to get early access 24 hours before the rest of the world as well as $250 off for 24 hours. Yeah, so it's a, it's a good deal. So look for that in your uh, a link. Looks like Mara, hopefully, did you drop that? Yes. She did. Thank you, Mara. She's so on top of it. The next thing I would like Mara to drop is what we talked about today. Um, another another link to the pamphlet. Um, again, we have that available for pre-order at zingtrain.com. They will be shipping out on February 1st. So just so people have a sense around timing. Um, and I know with shipments right now, um, it might take a little bit longer, but they will get to you. Um, and then last but not least, we would love to hear how you thought today went. So we're gonna drop a link to a survey, a very short survey to hear what you thought, as well as what you'd like to hear about in future webinars. We do these for you. So we wanna make sure they are as helpful as possible. And last but not least, we are going to be sending you uh, the recording here probably in the next 24 hours or so. So be sure to look out for that in your inboxes. Without further ado, I'm officially to wrap it up. Thanks for going a few extra minutes. Um, but thanks for joining us. Thanks everybody. I've, I've been closing a lot of the those nightly notes with uh, be safe, be kind. And uh, thank you again for everything. Thanks everyone.